Good game, I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. Hex, sometimes crowdfunded games get made and released and people play them. What? I know, such is the case with Hyperlight Drifter. Have fancied yourself much of a George Clooney, Bajo? I think of myself as more of a Sandra Bullock. Oh, well, tonight is your night because we play the very gravity-like Adrift. And that game has VR support as well. Speaking of VR, we invite Nick Boy to come chat to us about all the VR tech he got his hands on at GDC. This is me pulling back the slingshot. And Goose will be along with another IMO. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? Back in 2013, crowdfunding video games was all the rage, and gamers across the globe, including ourselves, threw money at anything that had any hope of recapturing our lost childhoods. Yes, of course, we're all a bit jaded now after seeing more than a few crowdfunded campaigns fall apart. But one of the more successful ones was for Hyperlight Drifter, which raked in just under $650,000. It's out on PC and Mac now, with console versions to follow. Yes, and it appears none of that money went into a tutorial. <laughs> yes, Hyperlight Drifter does nothing to help you figure out what is going on. But that's on purpose and arguably part of its charm. More on that in a bit, but first, Bajo, I found the introduction to this game quite affecting. The creeping 80s sci-fi style soundtrack is by composer Disasterpiece, who also worked on Fez and the excellent horror film It Follows. Yeah, the music and the art of that intro is straight out of something like Another World. You begin as a cloaked figure surrounded by corpses. You're coughing up blood as a strange digital black corruption chases after you. Wake to find yourself in a strange town with no direction of where to go or what you should be doing. Vendors and townsfolk don't speak your language and stories are told with pictures instead of words. Lead designer Alex Preston designed this game as an homage to the SNES days in look and feel as well as world design. Progression is slow and enemies are very difficult. You also have very little health, med kits are scarce, and your only initial ability really is a dash, which can get you into trouble as much as it gets you out of it. First thing I did, Hex, was walk into the forest. Dogs, dead, again and again. Then I took a break. Yeah, it takes a good few hours of exploring before you can figure out how this game works. But you just have to get out there and push through a few zones and enemies until the mechanics and ideas reveal themselves. Hex, I love that Alex has gone for this retro style, but I do think some retro things belong in the past. This exploration is so frustrating and confusing. You need to find these gems to unlock doors and progress. But there's no GPS, the map just stays static as you move through it, so you get a general idea of where the gems are, but finding the path to them is another story. Yeah, it's not the easiest of games to explore, is it? The 2D flat art style is a little hard to decipher at times, and falling really takes a good chunk of your limited health away. You do have to spend quite a bit of time creeping along the edges of maps or taking leaps of faith. But once again, this is on purpose, and I'm sure loads of people will really love this old school style. Yeah, look, if that hardcore exploration was for secret items, then that would be fine. But I just felt like some of those critical paths were so hard to find. Yeah, I mean, I think it's how you approach this game. You can't rush it or move in to clear a whole zone and then just move on. It's about taking out a few mobs, maybe going back to town to reward yourself with a hard-earned upgrade, and then maybe going into a different zone on the other side of the map for a while and just doing the same thing. The combat feels quite satisfying though, doesn't it? Absolutely. You've got a sword attack, a gun, a dash, and eventually you get bombs. There are some advanced moves, like combining a dash with a sword attack, but mostly success is about avoiding damage because you're so weak. Yeah, healing takes time too, and it's not always something you can do in the heat of battle. You're often trapped in rooms full of enemies combined with environmental problems, which will require some tricky legwork to survive. Attacking gives you power for your guns. You're always whacking stuff to shoot stuff, while dodging stuff. 
Eventually you start to learn enemy attack patterns and push on their weaknesses. I really liked the creature design and the controls are simple but there's still plenty of depth to the combat and when you clear a room without getting hit once it feels so good. brutal gameplay is something you just have to accept from the start. But once you get over that initial hump of figuring out how to dash about effectively, it is rewarding. You just can't be greedy. Get in, three hits, and then get out. Oh uh, yes, an ancient video game strategy, but a good one. Yeah, and at least the checkpoints are forgiving. And, you know, there's very much a one more go feel to these encounters. Yes, but sometimes you'll checkpoint on very low health without enough med kits, and that makes some of the fights more about luck than actual skill. I thought I would absolutely love this game. It's right up my alley, but I just found it really frustrating. All that old school exploration drove me crazy. I do love not knowing how a game works, and I think that approach to discovery can be really interesting. But just wandering around, finding some door or location that I missed, blurg. I don't know, Hex, back in the day I was more of a Sega guy than a SNES guy, so I spent more time with Sonic than Link. Maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, I don't mind wandering around that much. I think just because of that incredible soundtrack, and I just love the ideas in this game. Overgrown ruins and strange, dormant, giant creatures. Well, what are you giving it, Bajo? I'm gonna give it two and a half stars. Well, I'm giving it three and a half. Well, Hex, shall we go find Nick Boy for a chat about VR? Yeah, he's probably streaming. He's always streaming. Always on the internet. Oh, back in my day. Yeah, it's Sonic. Now, the final versions of the Oculus Rift and the Vive are released, but Hex and I do not have one. We cannot get one, and we haven't played with them. But someone got to go to GDC this year and get their hands on all over them all. Yeah, someone got to go to GDC, Nick. Nick, yeah. Nick, boy. Someone was looking for the cool VR guy. <laughs> yeah, but we have you. Tell us about all the cool stuff you played with at GDC. <laughs> so at GDC, everywhere I went, there was VR. But the main one that I ended up looking at was the Vive. Oh, OK, so the Vive is the VR headset that Valve have partnered with to release all their Steam yeah, VR Yeah, the Steam stuff. VR yeah, stuff, okay. yeah. I think for me, it's probably my favourite one that I've used. Really? It's really comfortable, but I think the hand tracking is really great and the moving around the space. I feel like I would be walking around in a room and be worried the whole time and not so immersed. There's a cool safety measure in, involved in it, is you kind of map out the area that you that you feel is safe to walk in. And then when you get to the edge of that area, so if you went, there's a wall there, so I don't want to walk into that wall. When you get close to it, a blue grid pops up in the game oh. to let you know that the, the physical wall is there. Yeah. But the thing that pulls you out of that is the cords. So because you're wandering around, you know, you've got the headset on this just giant cord hanging out the back. You're in this virtual space and maybe you're wandering through a forest or something, but then there's just this like cord banging against <laughs> everything. So really what you need is some kind of complex rigging system. There probably are already exists a Kickstarter for, you know, cable management. But every time I turned, because, you you know, the games are encouraging you to look around and move, you would turn 360 degrees and then I'll go, I am now wrapped in this cable, <laughs> yeah, okay. so I now need to go the other way. So there would be times where I'm playing a game, I was playing this mini golf game, and I'm turning around to take a shot and turn around to take another shot, and I realise I'm, I'm all wrapped up. And so then completely out of the game. I need to just stop and spin around the other way. It's like if Tiger Woods just took a shot and then just twirled for no reason, <laughs> like I just spin back. So yeah. I've mentioned the games will be like, we're not gonna make the character be able to turn in 360. We don't want them to do that and they'll encourage you to like redirect. I'm curious about how the games actually work. Yeah, so it, uh, talking specifically about the Vive, it, it was interesting that a, a lot of the games were just stand in the one spot. So there's an archery one and there's a, there was a very cool one, it's kind of portal themed where you're in a giant warehouse, there are these bowling balls that talk to you and then you put them in a catapult and you pull them back and shoot them at giant boxes. This just sounds like a weird dream you had. It's totally, yeah. Oh, hey, hey. I, am I up there? But I do think the games are designed for you to move around. So I don't know what the cable stuff is because they are going, you're in a fully immersed world. We don't want to fix you to this view. So would it be safe to say you are not completely sold on VR just yet? I will totally get a headset, but at the moment I'm not going to buy one because I just, I want to wait until I can see that there are experiences that I want to enjoy for more than 15 minutes at a time. You also had to play with the Oculus Gear VR. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so that one's really interesting. They used Minecraft Pocket Edition. 
it was so good. Yeah. Really? It was so good because Minecraft is blocky, right? Yeah. My, Minecraft is not great graphics. So on the phone, it looks nearly as good as it does on the computer. And when I was in VR, the headset's pretty light. You just click the phone in there. And I went, oh, I'm completely in Minecraft VR. Maybe the simpler the better. Maybe the future of VR will be just putting our phones in boxes. Maybe the other stuff is too complex. I, I, I will say that my favorite VR experience that I had at GDC was playing mini golf. Oh, I don't want to hear that, though. I know, and I didn't want to hear it either. Because I don't want to hear go... that VR means you can play mini golf anywhere. I know, like... we've reverted back to PSP era. But, um, uh, but it w I think it works because there's not a huge amount to render. So the art design was great. The graphics looked really good because you're, you're always just in this very narrow area. And it just felt great. You're swinging, you're hitting this ball, you're moving around the space. And it felt like, oh, yeah, I'm actually in this world. I can look around. But it's the most fun because it's pretty much what mini golf is. Mm. It's, it's almost a one-to-one -one representation. Mini golf is just doing this. So doing that in VR, it, it doesn't feel lacking at all. It feels like the actual experience. I've seen footage of you in a harness, and yes. I want to know more about it. That was the other thing, is that people are doing weird things with VR uh, that were just kind of proof of concept, I guess. That one of them, I was in this parachute harness, so I'm, I'm supported above the ground. My feet are sitting on this little rail, and then I've got the handles, like I'm actually in a parachute. So they put the headset on, and then I just needed to fly up in the air, and I needed to shoot uh, cars that were in this sort of military base thing. I, I was like, this is going to be so stupid. I hop in, and because my feet are suspended from the ground, I didn't think it would be a big deal, but I pulled down, so I sort of launch myself into the air. And as soon as I turn, because none of me is referenced on the ground, and I can't feel my feet planted somewhere, I nearly vomited because I just right. went, I'm actually in the sky right now and it's so terrifying. <laughs> and, and the whole time, because there's all these people watching, the whole time I'm swinging and shooting and doing this, I'm just going, Nick, don't hurl, man. Like, do not <laughs> hurl in front of all these cool people. But it's amazing because even those like old school, like, um, you know, rides where the chair would move slightly and you were just watching a cinema screen, yeah. even that simple motion does so much to make you feel like you know, you're on the minecart ride. Absolutely. So I can imagine having your feet raised and you're like, you know, controlling a parachute, then no, the full VR experience. Yeah, and no one's gonna have that rig in the house, but it was cool to it was cool to <laughs> well. see. The other rig that no one is going to have in their house is there was a sort of Birdman demo. It was this thing on a hydraulic system where you, you lie on top of it and you, you hold onto these wings and they have tilt and flap and you are a bird, and then as you flap your wings, you raise up in the air, and the hydraulic system raises the whole thing up, and then you start turning and twisting and that sort of thing. And then the whole time, the there's, dream. there's a... <laughs> That's the dream! And then the whole time, there's a fan in front of you that blows in your face as you fly. Tell me you got to be a bird man. I did not get no! to be a bird man. All of GDC wanted to be a bird man. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's the future of VR. It, like arcade rooms where you go and you can be bird man and you can sit in a harness. Stuff that you can't really have in your home and it's like a proper set up system. There's no faffing about it. That would and be it'll, amazing. And it'll sit next to where you charge your android and your robot dog. Yes. <laughs> and if you did multiplayer bird games, it would just be five of these machines. Five people pretending to be <laughs> birds in a warehouse. Caca! <laughs> oh, we can only hope. Well, thanks for joining us, Nick Boy. And next week's episode of Good Game is, in fact, just you, all about GDC. Yes, it's my whole trip, uh, the whole time I was there, interviewing devs, meeting cool Australian people who have gone over there for their first GDC or their 10th GDC. Uh, it was a really great week, so it should be a really good episode. Oh, can't wait to see it. Yeah. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, we go to the beach. Mm. Oh, that doesn't sound very fun. Just relax. Yeah. yeah. Chill out. This week, I want to talk about Let's Plays. I know, but you've already talked about Let's Plays, Goose, remember? Well, just shut up for a minute. This is completely different. Recently, one of the developers behind That Dragon Cancer, Ryan Green, spoke out against Let's Plays, saying that as a result of people watching and not playing their game, they apparently haven't seen a single dollar from sales. Where's my money? You gonna give me my money? Where's my money, man? And in my opinion, that does not seem fair. But before I dive too far into my own opinion, let's just run through the full story. So the reason he brought the issue up at all was because his team copped a fair bit of backlash after Let's Players got pinged with copyright claims for the game's soundtrack. This would have sent ad revenue from their videos to the soundtrack composer instead of them. Well, of course, the internet would have none of it. The video creators complained. The copyright was removed. 
and lets players were free once more to do their thing. But I'm sure the hypocrisy in that attitude isn't lost on many of you, nor was it lost on Green. Think about it. Let's Players were complaining that developers were profiteering off their videos. Videos exclusively made up of content lovingly created over many years by the game developers in the first place. Now, this isn't a black and white issue by any means. Nintendo copped a similar backlash for trying to get their share of the Let's Play pie a while ago. And somehow it's much easier to defend Let's Players in that situation. Hey, I'm not too worried. <laughs> There's a plenty of more where that came from. But when it comes to a small indie developer potentially losing sales and not being able to keep making games, I think we all feel a bit more sympathetic for the developers. Now, don't get me wrong, Let's Plays are by and large a great thing for games. And to his credit, Ryan Green absolutely agrees with that, saying the culture is really cool and adds value to the medium. Yes, this is why you came here. This is why you came to the internet. And for many games, Let's Play videos can actually create interest and boost sales beyond a developer's wildest dreams, or in some cases, nightmares. <laughs> But as he also points out, for short, linear, story-focused games like his, after watching a Let's Play, people have almost no incentive to go and play the game. It's kind of like having a friend sit down and tell you the entire plot of a film. Who'd have thought Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father? Ah. So what can be done? Well, as Green points out, often Let's Plays won't even have links to the game maker's website. And that seems like a totally reasonable request. If you're going to do a Let's Play video for a smaller indie game, toss in a link for where to buy it or at least how to support the developer. He also asked that if just a fraction of the viewers donated a dollar, well, that would go a long way to helping out. I mean, in some cases, many are already paying just to watch someone else play. Would it be so unreasonable to support the person who slaved over the code and bugs to build the damn thing in the first place? Of course not. In my opinion, the Let's Play community have a huge moral obligation to support the medium that supports them. By uploading these 30-part, full-run spoiler videos with no links and not even a single shred of subjective critique, they're unintentionally causing damage to the industry. So let's pay it forward, guys. Or should I say, let's play it forward. <laughs> Because trust me, audiences seriously appreciate that sort of philanthropy, and I'm sure in the long run, the developers will too. But that's just my opinion. Do you agree and think that Let's Players and their viewers should share the love more? Or should developers just be thankful they're getting any attention at all? Let us know on social media and we'll discuss it on tomorrow's episode of Pocket. Thanks, Goose! Zero G, Bajo! Ooh, a 3DS game. Style Boutique? That's mine. Oh. Bajo, just the other week I was saying the thing I was most excited about with VR was the potential for some space exploration game. Yes, and Adrift does have Oculus Rift support, but you can also play it the regular way with a PC or console. Yeah, and as most people are unlikely to have a Rift at home at the moment, we'll just stick to the straight up game review for now and talk about all the VR stuff at the end. Mm. Adrift takes place on a space station, or rather, what's left of one. <gasps> A terrible accident has occurred and you're left floating amongst the wreckage in a damaged spacesuit with dwindling oxygen. Warning, EVA suit critically damaged. Oxygen leak detected. Thinking fast, you managed to get your hands on some O2. And set about repairing the damage to the station enough to be able to survive. Spirit system repair required for Salvis EEV life support system operation. And hopefully launch an escape shuttle home. The first thing you need to grasp are the controls. You spend your entire time in this game in zero G. So basically, it's, it's a, a photo photo up. You need to use a combination of momentum and the little thrusters on your suit to propel you around the environment. Yes, but the thrusters use oxygen from your ever-depleting supply, so you have to be careful with how you use them. Oxygen station damaged. 
It's often easy in a game like this where movement is quite slow to just get impatient and spam that boost, but it's wiser to rely more on momentum and just make directional adjustments. I think the oxygen mechanic is a little too forgiving in this game. There is O2 literally everywhere, flashing green and conveniently floating along the path to your next destination. So I never really felt the need to be careful. Manual repair required for EED operation and launch. Yeah, I guess it's more when you go exploring the outer parts of the station. There are some long distances to cover and that can be pretty nerve wracking. Plus, I'm the kind of person that gets easily distracted and I don't notice that my O2 is getting low. So those moments when you are so close to grabbing some oxygen but it's just out of reach, or you miss it? Ugh. Yeah, you have to line up everything really carefully, don't you? And they make good use of the zero gravity control in that way. You can find yourself just floating past things you're trying to grab a hold of, and then you have to turn around and try again. Yeah, I mean, it takes time to get used to. At first, I tried the same method I use anytime anyone drags me ice skating of, I'll just use the wall to stop my momentum. But your suit slowly gets damaged over time when you take hits, so you kind of don't want to bump into stuff if you can help it. Oh! Oh. Now this is a future year 2037 space station, so all the technology is nicely designed and seems clearly laid out. But it's still a space station, so there's a lot that needs fixing. And each piece of machinery is, of course, at the furthest possible opposing location from one another. Yeah, I got really lost, and often I was going around in circles. It's just not always clear where you're supposed to go. There is a marker on your minimap, but a directional marker in space, which is multi-directional with ups and downs and everything, it's not always going to be helpful. Suddenly, with a distorted glitch, you are transported to a baseball game in China. I think you will reach a point where performing repairs through the various arms of this structure will get a little tedious. Manual activation required for outgoing communications to mission control. That's how it started to feel a bit for me. That said, the first half of the game, you barely notice because of the sheer magnificence of space exploration. That's enough. Hex, this gave me chills. Oh, there are some magical sights to behold, aren't there? You know, you do, for a moment, get that heart-fluttering feeling of what it must truly be like to set eyes upon Earth from space. Yeah, even the debris from the ruined space station has its own beauty. Yes, and then you pick up that audio log that starts playing Claire de Lune. Oh. misty-eyed Bajo. Yeah, it's just beautiful, isn't it? The audio logs are, of course, where the story can be found. You can access the quarters of certain crew members to find out more about them, read data transmissions, or listen to audio recordings of diary entries and messages. Hello, I'm Liam. I'm an addict. Hi, Liam. And these are the clues you have to piece together what happened. McDonough. Yeah, and this is where the game kind of let me down, I think. It just, there was this huge opportunity here to make the game so much more thrilling if the story had been, you know, more impactful. I agree. The repetition of all that repair work would have been lessened if there was a more engaging mystery to pull you through. You do get explanation and closure, though. Yeah, but it was just a little weak. And, you know, I had the same issue with the ending of Firewatch, but then that game was more about the relationship that develops between Henry and Delilah, so it still felt like a meaty narrative, whereas this was just... You know, it, it seemed like a missed opportunity. Well, we're still in the early days of games that have been developed with VR in mind. The focus now is still really on giving you that immersive experience. It'll be some time before we get that truly immersive story to go with it. Last week we said we wouldn't use that word, Bajo. Mm. But yes, we should talk about how this experience was with the Oculus Rift. Now, firstly, we don't have the final retail version of the Rift. We're using an old dev kit, which is far inferior. All right, let's go to space. 
Yeah, so we can't really share any impressions of the graphics in VR or even any of the motion sickness stuff because all of that has reportedly been vastly improved in the finished version. Let's do this. Yeah, but I think we can speak generally about how they've implemented VR within this game. Oh, I like my helmet. It's so cool being able to look around, like, inside your helmet, but also move the camera to kind of adjust what you want to see in the environment. I have to say, Bajo, that feeling of being totally abandoned in space, I felt it. Look at that, that is amazing. Oh, that window. <laughs> That's unreal. It's quite an adjustment getting used to your HUD being inside what is essentially your space helmet. Oh, I'm gonna run out of oxygen. I'm like Iron Man. But the fact that you are wearing a helmet in the game fits nicely with the fact that you have a VR headset on in real life. <laughs> I'm much more conscious of trying to like duck my head to <laughs> fit under things. Yeah, you kind of just want to forget about the game for a bit and just float around staring at Earth, don't you? Mm -hmm. Being in this environment is a VR dream come true. Like just this in it in and of itself is awesome. Oh man, <laughs> I feel so lonely up here. I'm so small. Earth is so big. Space is so empty. It's pretty incredible. If you do get your hands on an Oculus, you should totally jump straight into the VR experience for maximum impact. However, if you are struggling with some of the movement controls, you always have the option of just playing the game the regular way for a bit, just until you get the hang of it. Yeah, I think I benefited from doing that first, practicing in non-VR and then putting on the VR headset afterwards. All right, this, this station's wrecked. We're going, we're going straight to Earth. Oh, wow, you really do get that sense of vertigo. I, I, I feel like I am actually above the Earth. I don't know that I can personally sit and play the VR version in long stints like I can when playing the regular way. And I know you have a sensitive stomach when it comes to this stuff in general, Bajo. Yeah, I'm not good with motion sickness at the best of times. And uh, I know this isn't the final version of the dev kit either. So it's not really fair for me to be critiquing how sick I get from it. But I got really sick, Hex. Like within 10 seconds, I was feeling super ill. Space. Space is cool. Oh, space is not making me feel good already. <laughs> This is officially rated as an intense VR experience and it certainly was that for me. I need some tea, some ginger tea. Uh, well, that aside, how did you enjoy your time in space, Bajo? Well, it just feels like this is built off a tech demo designed to showcase VR rather than a fully fleshed out game. So once you move past the joy of floating in space, you may find yourself wanting more. I'm giving it two and a half stars. Yeah, there are so many great space thriller narratives out there that this could have taken advantage of to go along with that sense of weightlessness and wonder. I mean, you could technically rename this game Space Station Repair Simulator 2037, but you know, it, it still gets points for still giving me an experience unlike anything else I've had in a game before. So I'm giving it three and a half. Oh, get it. No! <laughs> It was so frustrating. Can't wait to get off this goddamn station. So, did you name the game for this week? It was Shoot Many Robots on console and PC from 2013. This frantic action platformer echoed co-op arcade greats of the past, fitting you and your buddies out with a variety of weapons to, yes, shoot many robots. And it was our name the game because it featured the music of Richard Disasterpiece Vreeland, who was the composer on this week's Hyperlight Drifter. Next week, we're not going to be here. No, Nick Boy's taking over. Look out. That's right. He's going to take us through his adventures at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. Now, I also mentioned that you have explicit control over the fuzz color. Now, if it was a ferret and a wolverine, Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Now oh, he had too much fun. So jelly. Over on Spawn Point on ABC3 this Saturday, we're going to be clicking through the gorgeous alien landscapes of Samorost 3. Uh, 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 uh. Ow. And a quick thank you to everyone who came and saw our live show in Melbourne last Friday. We had a great time, didn't we, Hex? Oh, totally. And you're next, Sydney. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Sarge out. What's your dream VR experience? Like the one that you're really hanging out for? My ultimate dream VR experience? Yeah. Uh, a PG one? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I think probably like a trolling simulator. So I'd go into a shopping center and just like mess with people and knock stuff off and like throw things at people and steal their food. Of yeah. all the things you yeah. could want to do, like anything, like go into space. That's you know, the dream. 
fly, you yeah. just want to go into a shopping center and just mess yeah. with stuff. Just like dack people and run. What goes on in your mind? I don't know.